Good evening, folks. I'm having a little bit of technical difficulties, so you'll need to bear with me for, for a few moments. Um, it won't take me long. Apologies about this. Um, I've had gremlins, so I'll be back. Okay, can you hear me now? Okay, I think you've muted yourself. I oh, think you... Me. Ah, yeah, no, I can hear you now. Sorry, because... Uh, sorry, that I thought, I thought you'd, you'd have gone very silent. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, I'm in a bit of a panic here, but it's okay. It's okay. Um, let me see now. Sorry, my camera has gone completely up the spout. We'll go with this camera. Okay. It's better. That's the keynote. I've managed to upload the, the PDF. This one we not need. Okay. We'll go as it is. Okay, are you ready? I am, yeah. Thank Excellent. You. <laughs> we'll make. Thanks. Yeah. <clears throat> Greetings, folks. Welcome to the studio. Sorry, I've had some technical problems. My camera packed up. I had to sort myself with another one. So, Anyway, enough of that. Um, I'm delighted to, to introduce um, for this evening's conversation Jackie Nowakowski, archaeologist who's an expert in the field of um, archaeology within Bodmin Moor and uh, within Cornwall as well. So, without further ado, Jackie, good evening. How are you? Hi, Harry. How are you? Excellent. I'm very well indeed. Thank you for being here this evening. It's absolutely great to, to have you as a guest. Thank you so much. Well, it's very kind of you to invite me to talk about the hurlers. Excellent. Great. So, um, shall we make a start? In terms of the hurlers, um, you've been doing research in, 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 in the latter years, but there's, there's, a, there's a history to the hurlers that goes back um, in terms of um, archaeology and, 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 and investigation, that goes back quite some time, is that right? And how far does it, when, when, when does this start? When, when was it kind of, when were they discovered as such? Um, well, that's a very good question. Um, we're not really quite sure exactly when they were discovered, but um, it's folk tradition and stories collected by travellers coming to Cornwall uh, certainly in the Elizabethan period, who would, who would sometimes notice these rather 
enigmatic monuments um, on places like Bobbin Moor. And the Hurlers has got a sort of folklore tradition um, of um, the stones representing people who were turned to stone because they were playing the hurling ball, which is a, a game on the, on the Sabbath, on the Lord's Day. So it's kind of fear and superstition which has kept some of these rather enigmatic, very ancient monuments alive and also within local folklore tradition. Um, but the Hurlers themselves, um, which are an extraordinary complex of um, three stone circles on Minions Moor, on Southeast Bodmin Moor, are really a very um, enigmatic but very special um, set of uh, prehistoric monuments because we we can look at them not just as a monument in its own specific setting but looking at it within a landscape context and that's really what um, we're all interested in as archaeologists today right so it's the br it's the broader context it not it's not just the three stone circles but it's how it relates to other um focal point, could we say, on the landscape, how it relates to a bigger whole, in other words. Yes, I mean, Cornwall's blessed with lots and lots of upstanding, well-preserved ancient monuments, on the, especially on the, the, the granite uplands. Um, Bodmin Moor is obviously one of the large granite uplands that we have down in the southwest here, um, and full of... Um, stone monuments, light stone circles, certainly lots of stone roundhouses and the small fields. So we, look, we can look at um, places where people are living in deepest prehistory, as well as places where people were creating, um, creating places, creating landscapes in which um, they came together as different communities and performed rituals and and ceremonies relating to their everyday life, but perhaps um, gathering at specific times of the, the, the seasonal year um, in order to um, commune with the ancestors and take part in ceremonies connected with life and death. And the, the beauty about the hurlers is a landscape is that you to understand the monument, these three stone circles, uh, you have to really look beyond the edges of the, st the stone circles and see them within their setting, so that you see them in relation to distinctive hills and, pl and places and other monuments within that landscape. Mm -hmm. And um, archaeologists in recent years um, have brought have done surveys of Bob Moor where we're able to map those landscapes and chart those those incredible patterns of monuments within the landscapes and then start to tease out their meanings and tease out stories attached to those places. Of course. So it's a question of literally reading the landscape and interpreting. I think it's what I find quite fascinating is already then in, 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 the, in the Neolithic and Bronze Age, around 5000 BC, that human, dare I say, societies or communities were already marking the landscape, claiming it as their own. And in a way, somehow, this, this marking the landscape is definitely a shift from what was happening earlier in the hunter-gatherers. There is no evidence of marking the landscape in that way. It's only with the Neolithic, the stone monument, the monumental stone building, that then is that then starts the the marking of the landscape. Yes, you're absolutely right. I mean, it is during the what, the Neolithic and the what we call the early Bronze Age period. So over a period of you know five to four thousand years, three thousand years ago, people were constructing um, constructing places by making these monuments um, in order to come together to gather and to sort of celebrate the ancestors and also to commune with um, nature. But they were also um, principally uh, marking places which previously, in, even in uh, the earlier periods, like the Mesolithic, as you say, the, when people are more highly mobile, moving across the landscape, um, those places were also very important um, to, to, to earlier peoples, because one of the things that we do know about the hurlers, when we look at some of the artifacts that have been found 
um, associated with those this stone circle, this triple stone circle complex, um, we've recognized that there are some earlier artifacts associated with, with, with this particular location. So it's a place that's obviously very special for, for deep, deep prehistory. Um, and it all becomes a bit more um, landmarked, if you like, you know, in the Neolithic and the early Bronze Age period. So um, maybe it's quite a good idea to have a look at some of the images that we pulled together. Yes, yes. Let me let me let me go to that. But before before that, let me let me just um, take up with 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 our audience, with our participants. I'll I'll, I'll I'll be back, folks. What we're doing this evening is um, we we would actually like you to send your comments and questions as we go along please and then we will retake them and weave them into the conversation so if you'd like to 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 do that any queries any questions any comments that you have don't wait till the end send them now and and then we'll actually retake them so that would be absolutely great um, could i have a thumbs up that if you if you've got that if you if you've heard that that would be absolutely great that would be wonderful. Also, while you're at it, if you could actually just say what, um, what country you're from, what uh, town, what city, what country, that would be really good to, to, to actually know. What we want to do with these um, conversations is make them participatory and make them inclusive, as inclusive as the technology allows us to actually do. So, um, yeah, that would be absolutely great. Excellent. Jackie. I'll go back. I'll go to the the keynote presentation, and um, we'll start with the aerial view, the hurlers from the air. Okay. Well, um, you know, we won't. We were. We were. We were. When we discussed this, Harry, we were talking about having a conversation. So it's not really a formal lecture that we're giving, but just um, to introduce people to this incredible landscape. I've yes. selected a few, few images. Um, for some people who've probably never even been to Cornwall or this part of Bodmin Moor. But on, on this aerial photograph, um, I don't know if you can see, does the cursor, can you see the cursor if I move it around? Uh, I'm not sure. Um, well, it, um, can, <laughs> well, <laughs> um, well, possibly, well, I don't know. I don't know if they could see the cursor, but um, you can see well, the circle well, in the middle. You could, that, that, that's, so, so the hurlers is a complex of three stone circles on mm -hmm. Minions Moor and South East Cornwall, on Bodmin Moor. This is the central circle, this is the northern circle, and there's a little circle here called the southern circle. And you can see from this aerial photograph that it's actually quite a difficult sight to, to, to actually uh, see from the air, because not all the stones are there uh, within the various circles. And also there's lots and lots of pitting and pocking around this landscape, and all of that is evidence for um, mining in the medieval and later historic periods. So it's a very challenging place in terms of looking at the sort of co cohesion of the monument because um, quite a lot of it has been badly disturbed. But it's um, the three circles appear to be aligned um, on a north, northwest, south, southeast alignment. And um, they all are um, built and created in relation to one another. So they appear to be contemporary. But of course, we don't really know exactly how or when they were built, because finding that kind of direct evidence is actually quite challenging arch archaeologically. But if we um, have a look at the next slide, um, and can you can you go to the next slide? Yeah. yeah. Uh, OK, so this is this is the central circle. No, this is the northern circle on the ground. And you can see a series of granite dressed granite stones around the circuit of the northern circle. Um, the, the most important thing when we when we tried to sort of understand something about how these monuments worked and how they operated is that we have to look at their landscape setting, as I said. And so um, the hill that you see with this mask raised on it, just in the background, is a massive hill called Carradon Hill. Um, and that is one of the significant hills uh, within this wider landscape. Um, on this hill, 
uh, was a large barrow cemetery of up to 20 Bronze Age burial monuments, um, which, which are part of this sort of wider ceremonial and ritual landscape. So um, we go to the next little, little image. So you'll see um, one of the significant other monuments within this broader landscape. And we'll have a look at the locations of these in a minute. But this, um, this image here is a picture looking down upon Rillerton Barrow. It's one of the largest Bronze Age burial monuments on Bodmin Moor. It's mm -hmm. never been excavated, um, but it lies within the immediate landscape locality of the Hurlers. Uh, there's a little gap here on the, the image that we can see, and that shows a stone chamber or a kist, which was broken into around the sort of the earlier part of the 19th century. And, and inside that kist, there lay the remains of a complete skeleton of a person, um, a, a, a ceramic cup inside that ceramic cup was this golden cup this gold handled cup called the Rillerton cup and it's a very unique object and whoever was buried with this cup must have been a very important and special person when it was found originally it had a rounded base so that it was a cup that uh, you, you would hold but you couldn't actually put down because it had a rounded base um, and that base became flattened when the cut went into the possession of uh, Queen Victoria because it ended up at Osborne House on the Isle of Wight before it ended up in the British Museum. So what, what we're looking at at the moment is we're, we're building up a picture of the, the hurlers situated in a landscape with other major monuments around it. And we have a look at the next image. Um, if you don't mind doing that, mm -hmm. we can see another major hill, um, which is within the, 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 what, the immediate vicinity of the hurlers, and this is Stowe's Hill. So Philip uh, Marsden, in his talk the other day, mentioned Stowe's Hill, because it's an yes. incredible, incredible beast, peak, natural, natural topography, but it's been um, embellished and enhanced by human activity, so creating a place. So this at this end of the hill it's been gouged away by cutting away for granite as a major granite in, uh granite extraction industry in this area in the 20th century in the 19th and 20th century but you can see here just where the the the, the landmark known as the cheese ring is you can see this rather extraordinary stone embankment um stone enclosure at, at this end of the stowe's hill and then you can see other lines of stones, which are all parts of collapsed stone walls, forming a, a much larger enclosure. And Stowe's Hill is an incredibly um, important and um, significant hill within this landscape. And we, we believe that this may well be um, the, the reason why the hurlers actually um, becomes built um, within this sort of landscape, because this hill is, is very important to the story of the hurlers. We, it's never been excavated, so, uh, any of this. There are two Bronze Age barrows at this end of the hill, um, and they are both aligned and sitting on a, an outcrop of Elven. So there's a sort of relationship between place and geology, which is really mm -hmm. very significant to the stories. So if we, um, <laughs> sorry, I'd, so if we go back now to the next slide and we can just um, have a quick look at where <laughs> these things on my location map where these things Did are. you say back to the so if we go to, sorry if we go forward to the next one. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. There. Yeah. So, so this so this will help everybody that doesn't know what would who doesn't know the area very well. But the hurlers are three stone circles and there they are sitting on this basin surrounded by a massive hill, Caradon Hill, which I mentioned there with the Bronze Age Barrow Cemetery, Stowe's Hill at the top there. There's the Rillerton Barrow. Um, on the edges of where the fields are, this, all these lines represent enclosures, which are historic enclosures made in the medieval and the, the later the 18th and 19th centuries. There are the, the remains of roundhouses and small fields, which represent sort of Bronze Age and Iron Age settlements. Um, but this whole area here, you can see that there's also another stone circle called Craddock Moor Stone Circle, not far away from the, the hurlers. 
um, this, this occupies a kind of sort of mini locale, a sort of separate landscape, which is not visible from the hurlers, uh, mm -hmm. but occupies its own kind of little sort of shallow basin and, and um, valley. And there's a, there, there are other monuments here. There's a stone row, which is a line of stone set in a, a linear line. And um, there's the, the thing called the pipers, which are two standing stones related to the hurlers. And um, again, at Tregaric Tour in this direction, we've got roundhouses and small fields as well as on Craddock Moor as well. So um, within a sort of um, six kilometer radius, you've got this amazing well-mapped uh, landscape where all the monuments you see uh, the, from, the, from, the, from prehistory are placed in relation to one another as, mm -hmm. as well as in relation to hills. Minions as a village, which is just lies here, um, is very recent. It's very modern. It's, it's, it, 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 it evolved as a result of the, the, the tin and copper rush in the, the mid 19th century. So prior to, um, prior to that, this whole area was really quite desolate and abandoned, which, which, which is one of the reasons possibly why it was just neglected and fairly remote and the hurlers um, just existed as, a, as an abandoned complex of stone circles. Right. Anyway, so that's, that's hopefully that will give everybody the, a bit of bearing about what we're talking about. And, and really, to try to understand what these monuments are, we have to look at it within a sort of wider canvas. of a, like, It's like a sort of a, a storybook of related places, which exactly. will link with um okay so, so it's it's actually um, see it's actually seeing it in, in 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 within the context because as everything does things don't exist in a bubble but they exist within a broader context and as as now as, as it happened then they they have a relationship hence this is where when you actually say mentioned in the text about reading the landscape that's exactly what we're doing it's in in the map it gives us the clue of how these ancient monuments related one to another that's right i mean i mean principally what happens here is the landscape acts as a kind of theatrical setting an arena in which things are happening because the monuments don't really have any edges they just have um views inwards and outwards and um, the things that are going on around these monuments are all um, inextricably linked and they probably all appear in the landscape in a kind of in incremental way rather than all being built at the same time because they are respecting a place where past communities certainly in the bronze age and the neolithic and maybe in them even in the mesolithic the ancestors are resident in are resident and dormant in this landscape, in the hills, in these places, and they be, it becomes a place of respect, ceremony, um, and it's not domesticated, but it's it it becomes a sort of theatrical installation of rather enigmatic monuments um, mm -hmm. like the stone circles and the stone rows and the standing stones. So. Um, our interest in recent in re so our interest is built upon the work as 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 uh, as uh, the work of other of other antiquarians and archaeologists and if we go to the the other the next image mm -hmm. um, it will you'll see there's an early interest in recording uh, these monuments and this is a very early sketch by somebody called Nicholas Whiteleaf of Truro. Who went up there in the um, who went up to Bob Moor from Truro in the 1840s? I think he was an engineer. But anyway, so he was he's very interested in mapping these places. And this is his sketch of the three circles. There's one, there's, there's the central circle, the northern circle, and the southern circle. And he also um, shows the two, what they call the pipers, or the or in the 1930s, they were called the pointers. And he's also showing the condition of the monument. He's showing that some of the standing stones have disappeared, some of them are lying down. And he, so he sort, of, he sort of kind of guesses, you know, how many, 
how many stones there might be in each circle. And that's a really tricky thing because um, every time you count the numbers of standing stones within a stone circle, they never, you never get the same number. So you, you get this kind of feeling that you're being played with by the spirits of the ancestors. They're not really allowing you to, to really, um, yeah, to really sort of uh, hold them down. So yeah, pin anyways, them down. Is, yes, it's, 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 so it's, it begins that's to be something that's more ethereal, evanescent, so almost. Is, absolutely, and you know, uh -huh. and that is part of this 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 whole arena, this theatrical setting, is that the, whatever is going on there, um, when people gather there at certain times of the year, um, there's obviously well, there's not obviously, but it's 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 kind of um, not slightly, it's slightly supernatural it's it's slightly whimsical maybe it's it's deeply spiritual and deeply connected to the energy and the vibrations of of, of the place the vibe i think um, exactly. so, so so if we have just look at and um, so this is this is what happens in the 19th century people start recording these monuments and we've got some early we've got some very good measured uh, sketch uh, drawings of uh, later in the 1890s uh, and 90s of the hurlers um, mm. but also we've got another interest which is emerging around about the turn of the 20th century and that is the looking at these monuments in relation to the sky the skyscapes the wider the wider landscape and um, the next little image will show you an attempt by um, an, um, a very distinguished um, mathematician and scientist called Sir Norman Lockyer he was really interested in the idea of um, stone circles being um, mapping mapping the skies, being linked to celestial uh, celestial um, alignments, and he was really this is his plan of the hurlers round about 1910. That is Rillerton Barrett at the top there. These are the three circles, and he was looking at um, alignments to the solstices and the equinoxes and um, he was quite keen on the idea that the three circles are aligned on, on onto the winter solstice um, and perhaps mapping and mirroring uh, the Orion's belt of the three circles as well. And he also proposed the dates of constructions of, e of, of each of these circles as well. Now, some of those ideas today are a, a bit, um, people are a bit more skeptical about that, but um, but people are coming to gain to look at these types of monuments in terms of their astronomical significance. And um, I'm not going to talk about that because I, I, you're going to be talking to Carolyn Kennett, one of my co-workers, about looking at the hurlers in relation to the skyscapes. Um, That's right. Yes. In your next, your next talk. So this is a very good so, introduction of actually where Carolyn in a way is taking her work yeah. and her investigation forward. Yeah. So, so, um, so what I'm just, what I'm saying is, is that the interests uh, um, in people studying these sites are, are really quite sort of multidisciplined and varied. So, um, if we have a look at um, the history of what we know about the monuments today, um, so the next next little image I've got is of uh, what happens in the 1930s. So. The monument itself, these three stone circles, are in a very poor state, poor condition. And so there is a campaign, a local campaign, um, by somebody who was, who was the chairman of the Old Cornwall Federation, an Old Cornwall Historical Society. He instigated the restoration of the hurlers. And that, um, by, um, by doing that, you have to... Uh, you have he had to get somebody, an, an archaeologist, to excavate. And this is an image taken from the excavation archive, which has never been published because the full work that was carried out there in the 30s was never fully published. Right. And um, this is really where I come in because I very <laughs> accidentally came, wow. across this, came across this archive. Wow. Um, um, I'm... I have done work on other excavations in Cornwall, and I was very interested in a local archaeologist who lived at Durai, just outside Minions, called Charles Kenneth Croft Andrew. 
And Charles Kenneth Croft, Croft Andrew was a very prolific field worker in Cornwall in the 30s. And he's, he's never, he's, he's done a huge amount of work. And he was involved in the excavations of the hurlers with another very well known uh, archaeologist called Rally Radford, who happened to be digging at Tintagel at the very same time. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so this archive appeared, and um, this is an image showing you one of the stones in the central circle, which was um, leaning over, um, but it was put back in its original socket hole. So the whole um, excavation program that took place in 1935 and 1938 was all about um, putting back um, fallen stones, putting, back, putting them upright back in their socket holes. Now, of course, some of the stones were missing, so they found the socket holes for the stones, but they, the, the standing stone had already been um, taken away, probably because of the construction of the engine houses um, by the miners that are working in the local locality. So there's quite a lot of destruction going, that, that went on in the 19th century here. Um, but anyway, so what, what you see today when you go to visit the hurlers is that you see a partially reconstructed ancient monument. Um, and um, so, so we found this art, well, I, we found this archive about um, 10 years ago and it, it instigated a huge amount of interest. And as a result of that, we managed to get um, um, interest to start looking at, to do a, a, a couple of community archaeology projects where we could go back and look at some aspects of these excavations. And the next little image will show you, um, will show everybody one of the most surprising things that was found. Oh, during yes. This. Because this is something that you can't see today because it's buried. Yeah. But between the, the, what we call the northern circle at the top here, and this is where the central circle was this rather extraordinary stone surface. Now, this is art, another artificial stone surface, uh, which was uncovered in 1938 by Radford and Croft Andrew. And um, it, it, it's, it's just a, a really unique and invisible feature of the hurlers. And so um, we wanted to find out more about it. And of course. so the projects that we developed um, in 2013 and 2016, uh, two community projects, as I said, uh, we, wanted to, we wanted to do minimal amount of excavation, um, but we wanted to find out more about whether this feature was still, still buried, still in situ, and whether we could, well, we could find out more about it really. Um, now, of course, this is a scheduled ancient monument, so nobody can just go and dig there. You have to get permission. And also, the, the land is, is not common land. It's owned by the Bodmerwall commoners and the duchy and a whole range of people. So obviously, in order to do any archaeological excavation, new excavation there, we had to gain the permission of all these um, in agencies, and, and they were very supportive of our work. And um, Anyway, the next the next um, image will give you um, 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 this is what we uncovered uh, yes. in 2013 in the our mod project. the modern day photograph. The, the other one That's was right. the 1930s, and this is the late 20th century, 21st, yes. 21st century. Yes, except I have to say that caption is not quite correct because that image I didn't take that image. It's it might my, my colleague Alan Endicott took that image um, and um, but anyway so this is um, so this is look this is this is the excavation trench we uncovered as part of the mapping the sun project and this was a as I say a community archaeology project with myself and some, some uh, my colleague James Gossett and um, um, Laura Ratcliffe um, so there were three of us who are professional archaeologists working with a team of volunteers and um, so this is the stone pavement that was uncovered by Radford and um, Croft Andrew in the 1930s. It was still there. And it's rather remarkable. It's, um, it's about 15 meters long. It doesn't um, connect, it, it lies between the central and northern circle and it's very neatly made. And it's got a sort of stones that 
edge one end of it and then these stones at this end sort of trickle just trickle out onto more stone but all the stones are very neatly compacted and if you see the if you show the next slide um the next image this is this is everybody excavating it so mm -hmm. um this is yeah okay so and you can see that it's it's quite extraordinary um and you can see actually look what look at atmosphere this is a typical day on yes. more the hurlers where Absolutely. it's all shredded and mixed <laughs> anyway so um so, so what we wanted to do is we wanted to find out more and um, how can we date this and and, and, it, and what is it? Um, it's not a pavement as such because it's not it's all lumpy bumpy as a surface and you can't really kind of walk on it in, in any comfort. Um, this stone here uh, protrudes from the natural part of the land um, and it's a white sort of gray quartz stone which we ended up calling the pyramid stone because it's got a sort of pyramid shape. Mm -hmm. And all these other stones are sort of tightly packed around it. And within the stones, we found uh, a couple of um, flint tools. So ancient uh, flint tools, um, uh -huh. one of which is just this one here that I've got that you can't, you can't probably can't see, but it's, um, it's a little stone tool um, made of... Um, beach flint and let, um, let, let, me, let, let me put you on the on on, on another on another yeah. screen just a second okay. there yeah okay. um i don't i don't know whether you can possibly see it actually can you there. oh here it's a very tiny it's a very small piece of flint um with a serrated edge they're all worked and um it's probably a late neolithic tool that's been deposited within the, the stone pavement. Right. Um, and it's in, in very fresh condition, which uh -huh. is quite remarkable as well. And um, so these objects, these um, other flint tools were found by Radford and his team in the 1930s. And this, this little collection um, of about 20 flints is actually the largest collection of stone tools, flint tools we have for any any stone circle monument in Cornwall. So, so they're Amazing. all very special and they've never been looked at before because as I say, the, the, um, the excavation was never properly written up, but we've been doing that as part of our project. So, um, so all these objects um, would have been brought here by people who were visiting the stone circles during the times that they, they visited the stone circles. And these flints are coming from beach flint, which means that they're probably coming from some distance away onto the moors from um, from the coast. Absolutely, um, yes, because there is there is no flint on there is because there is no. Sorry. Well, there there is flint. There is there is natural flint in some parts of um, the coast parts of Cornwall, but yes. principally yes. people were using beach beach pebble flint to make their tools um, at this time. Um, but it does show that the hurlers was was a destination, was a destination in the Bronze Age and the, even the, in the late Neolithic period as well. Um, okay, so the stone, what we call the stone pavement, which really isn't a pavement, it's it seems to be aligned to, um, well, Carolyn will talk more about this, but it seems to be a to Rillerton Barrow, which is the large barrow I mentioned before, which which sits on the sort of the, the far near horizon. Um, okay, and one of the things that is really interesting, not just is is that we uh, the geologist on our team had a look at all the different types of stones within this stone pavement, for want of a better word. And he found that there was a whole variety of different types of granite and elvens and quartzite and mica. So there's, it looked as though the stones had been collected from a wide range of different sources. Uh -huh. So this is, this is where it becomes really quite intriguing because he also started to look at the, the granite of the standing stones within the stone settings themselves. And, um, he was looking, they're all, all the stones that the hurlers are made of granite, which is the, the natural rock that you get on this part, you know, on, on this granite moorland on Bobbin Moor. 
Um, but they had different compositions in terms of ratios of feldspar and quartz. So Callum was started to notice that there were differences in, in the individual stones that make up the individual circles. Um, so this prompted us to do even more work, uh, trying to find out more about the origins of the granite stones to see whether they were particularly local um, to the, the place where they eventually came to to make up these monuments. Um, so in 2016, we, we, we did another project called Reading the Hurlers, and that was all about trying to find out more about the stones and the materiality of these monuments and whether the, whether the geology was going to be a significant influence in the way that people, people understood the rocks and how they valued the rocks and how they used the rocks in the construction of their monuments. Absolutely. So, um, so the, the, the other image I've got, um, which is our the last image. Yes, let me um, go back to that. The last image is, uh, if, you, if, you, if you don't mind um, just going to the next, next one. Yes, um, there. So, it, so three years later, we, 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 we went back to the, to, to the landscape and we, we investigated um, an area where uh, colleagues had, early, had earlier proposed there may well have been a fourth circle. Um, and we were very intrigued by this because uh, there was, uh, this is about sort of 100 metres just to the north of the, the north circle in the complex. And there's a sort of uh, uh, an, an ele slightly elevated area there, which, which was sort of uh, slightly level. And um, protrude, um, by, by prodding underneath the soil, you, you could make out a circuit of up to 12 um, stones, which may well have made up a, another stone circle. Anyway, so, in, so we went back with another community project, um, and part of that was to sort of investigate whether, in fact, there was another monument there which was missing or had hidden, buried in the landscape. And although we didn't actually find a circle of stones, we did find this stone here, which was actually sitting proud um, on the grass, stone F. And this, what you're looking at here, is you're looking at a standing stone which has fallen over. Right. And just behind um, Sally here in the red, uh, we found uh, the socket hole for that stone. And um, so that stone was actually uh, an ancient monument which had been demolished. We don't know exactly when, probably well, it might, might have been demolished much earlier than the, sort of the 19th century, because it's never been recorded before. And um, we found the, 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 we found within the socket hole, we found um, the tip of a, a Neolithic arrowhead, a flint tool, right. which was really, really fun to find, <laughs> um, because that was just amazing. Anyway, mm -hmm. so, so, this mon so this stone, when it, when it was originally upright, would have stood about 1.5 meters high. And its location is really intriguing because it seems to be um, aligned uh, right down through the center, through the three circles and onto our pavement, which we we, which we uncovered in 2015, um, 13. Mm -hmm. So yes. now, so this stone was looked at and um, again, our geologist um, suggested that this stone um, okay, so what I should have said is that as part of this particular project, we had up to 50 volunteers going around uh, collecting data on all the granites within a sort of 10 kilometer radius of the, of the hurlers. Right. Quite a phenom phenomenal data set they've collected. Of course. And from, from about 750 locations, they whittled it down to 150 locations. So they collected a huge amount of data where they could see differences in the proportion of quartzite, feldspar to quartzite within the granites. And it's from this that um, it's been suggested that the source of, of stone granite for each individual component of the hurlers and, and also this particular stone are from different hills within the wider landscape. So this comes back full circle to my story about the reading the landscape and pulling those various narrative threads from distinctive places. And um, 
So I can't, um, I'll just have to remind myself that um, I've got it here, um, that the circle, uh, that this stone, Callum thought, came from um, Stowe's, Stowe's Hill. Um, the stones, um, the, so the stones that make up what, what is known as the Southern Circle, which has never been excavated and wasn't restored in the 1930s, so it's still in a very poor condition. Um, he suggests come from an area of Craddock Moor, which is at least two or three kilometres to the um, west, northwest of the, of the Hurlers landscape. The stones from the Central Circle, he suggests, comes from Carradon Hill, the, the hill right down uh, towards the coast, but close by that's got the Bronze Age Barrow Cemetery that I mentioned earlier. And the stone from the Northern Circle um, probably comes from a part of Craddock Moor where there is a, um, a quarry called Goldings Quarry. So, I mean, all that, all that evidence is really very intriguing because it starts to knit together these monuments with natural places in the landscape. And, and has an implication really about how people valued or how how they um what their relationship with natural resources and how some of those places may have had stories which they brought within the rocks which they brought um you know to construct a place and to construct these monuments so um they, they are interpretive ideas we can build on those those ideas but it's very intriguing because we do know if you if you look at um, I'm sure most people have heard about the story about the stories about Stonehenge where part where the monument is a, is a monument of many parts with with stones being dragged from different places the Priscillas the Sarsons coming from uh, another part of Salisbury Plain so the the importance of rocks and hard you know the, the importance of the geology is 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 more than just uh, a natural material for hardness and functionality. It's got um, a cultural a cultural meaning, I think, and I think that they're the things that we so difficult for us to sort of you know penetrate the mindset of. But they seem to be very important. So um, it makes the the whole um, a panorama and the whole sort of theatrical uh, in, uh, setting of the Hurlers landscape um, really very intriguing. Um, absolutely dynamic. dynamic so 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 it allows us to sort of see these monuments in a, in a in a dynamic way that articulates things about people and their relationship to land um their relationship to um their daily daily lives and also the incorporation of the burial burial monuments within the landscape you've got um, aspects of life and death being written into the land inscribed into the land i'm exactly. sorry harry it no, sounds no, a bit no. like really but anyway no so. no 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 it's fine it's no, no, you 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 you're absolutely fine but j just let me say a, a couple of things no no it's great this is it's excellent you're a wealth of knowledge you're fantastic thank you but i i, I spent quite a lot of time photographing on bodmin moor um going there for extensive 10, 12 hour shoots, um, looking at the landscape, taking it all in, uh, and primarily looking at uh, the area around the hurlers, and then spending more time in the, around the area near Rao Tor. Um, that is the area where I'm most familiar with. And what struck me was the, the fact that these elements, these, these stone um, monuments, these architectural structures were des high, high, heavily designed. It wasn't something that was haphazard. This wasn't a, a weekend DIY project, right? Knocking something up in, in, in a, a, a work surface in the kitchen. This was actually very deliberate in terms of sourcing the stones, as you've just expanded on, which is absolutely fascinating. Right? Not just sourcing the stones, but also designing how they're actually going to source them, how they're actually, what techniques are they going to use to cut them out, to extract them, then to transport them down to the site as if they were parts of a jigsaw puzzle. And then 
which in, in some way that probably escapes us, probably not, I don't know, then put them all together, which is kind of, bear in mind, this would have been a huge communal effort. Um, they didn't have mechanized nothing. It would have been by hand, by traction. They probably would have had oxen and stuff like that. They had the wheel, apparently, I believe. And then assemble this together in such a way that it still stands after... 5,000 years, which is absolutely extraordinary. So there's no accident in this. And I think the other thing that struck me is the symbolic meaning. You mentioned it, you know, the cultural, the cultural meaning. Yes, there's a, there's a sim, sim, symbolism, but call it magic, call it shamanism, but definitely there's some sort of huge, huge investment in, 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 in terms of effort, in time, resources, skills, know-how, and the list goes on, which is absolutely fascinating. But, but, but before, before, yeah, absolutely, for, absolutely right. I mean, I think, I think, yeah, yeah. The, the, the the social investment is the most, and the social investment is linked to sort of the cultural meaning of these places, and I think that's such, such a um, a tremendous. Um, well, it's the inscription into the landscape of uh, stories, uh, memories, of, of, of building that up, that multi-layered sort of time depth. Uh, and, you know, these monuments, I think Philip was talking about it last week, you know, Bob mm -hmm. Memora has got sort of a, multi, a deep history, a deep prehistory with the multi-layered uh, monuments. And um, he's absolutely right. Um, and we're very fortunate in Cornwall where we have a lot of upstanding prehistoric monuments where we can, we don't have to dig them all, but we can look at them in relationship to the patterns that within the landscape and we can chart them and we can survey them and we, we can hypothesize and interpret how we map the land and how we read the land as well. Absolutely. Folks, um, if you have any, any comments, any questions, please put them through. You're, you're very quiet this evening. <laughs> but let me just go through some of the comments that that we've actually that we've actually had. Alan, Alan, hi, Alan. Practice makes perfect, indeed, indeed. Thank God I had a, a backup to my camera. So yes, that 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 saved the day. Um, Heidi from Red Ruth, Cornwall. Hi there, <laughs> a local. That's great. John, I remember John. You were here before. Thank you for, for returning. Jackie mentioned the mapping of the Cornish landscapes. Is this available to me? Um, well, there's, um, we produced a booklet called Mapping the Sun. I think we've got an image of it. Um, yes, we do. Um, let which, me go which, to it. Which, which um, you should be able to get from... It's um, the next one, isn't it? Yeah. This one here. Yeah, uh, you should be able to get it from uh, Cornwall Archaeological Unit, um, Cornwall Council. Um, they will have copies of that, which which really sums up um, the first project that we did. And then um, the story, the, the more detailed stories, um, we, Carolyn, Kenneth, myself and James and Brian, we published a paper last year looking at um, looking at the hurlers and this one here that's right and that that is published and that you should be able to get that online that's published in the journal of skyscape archaeology um and carolyn will probably talk a bit a bit more about that next week in her talk um and then we're writing up um another paper about um the, the geology, this, um, you know, some of the things I've, I've talked about tonight and also the background to, to the projects as well as um, a discussion of the antiquarian um, surveys and the research in the hurlers too. So, um, so it's, all, it's all coming out and um, we're continuing to, to be interested in the landscape because one, one, one of the things is finding that new fallen standing stone shows that there are still places still places to discover um, in 2009 we found two new stone rows um, with, within this landscape which we thought was very familiar to us already because it'd been so well mapped but you can always find new things in places where where you think you've know you know you know very well so you know absolutely absolutely um let me retake this marion hello marion 
from Princeton, New Jersey, USA. Wonderful from across the pond. That's great. Thank you so much for being here. Richard. Richard and Faye from Hel from Helston, Cornwall. Hello, Richard and Faye. How are you? Thank you for being here. That's great. Good to see you. Um, John Webb. Um, Jackie's presentation was wonderful. Oh, sorry, was a wonderful addition to Philip Marsden and his oh, story you. of the spirit of place. Yes, it's a, yeah, I'm, you're absolutely right, John. It's an absolute brilliant compliment because on the one hand, we, we, we've got both sides of the coin and that is so so rare. I think we, we've been incredibly lucky with the, with the speaker lineup. Um, next one, Richard. You mentioned that the circles are in some way related to the ancestors. Can you expand on this? Well, um, we are looking at a landscape which is created principally to celebrate and commemorate um, burial, um, death, uh, but life cycles too, because with the large barrows and the uh, barrow cemeteries within the landscape, we know that people are being curated within the land by being buried in these monuments. Rillerton Barrow with, with the gold cup um, is a monument which we really don't understand very much about. Um, the little chamber on the side of it, uh, the southeast side of it, looks out, has fantastic views looking out across the, the lower part of Bob Memora, across over towards Dartmoor. Uh, that person with the gold cup, it's not a you it's not an everyday um, object, must have been very important, very special. So that person is probably imbued with social importance, power, maybe a shaman, who knows, um, given special treatment on, um, on, on their death. During the Bronze Age, generally speaking, we're talking about people being cremated rather than whole bodies being buried. So the sacred sa sanctity of life of particular people, particularly important people who become part of the ancestral story of particular communities um, is being celebrated, being inscribed into the land. So I think that's what I mean by um, the ancestral geographies. I mean, that's not a phrase that I've made up. It's a phrase that many prehistorians have used over the last 20 years, particularly when we talk about sort of the spirit of place and the sanctity of specialness of um, place as well. So um, hopefully that's answered your questions um yeah absolutely and 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 also the, there's this also this other symbolic interaction you mentioned the arrowhead found at the base of that fallen stone and the other objects that you that you showed us the wonderful flint objects that you showed us that were found recently on the on, on the on that paving pavement which which by the way looks from a distance from that aerial shot let me just go or from that high shot let me yeah. just go to it um, what struck me that one is you can see it there that the straight line but it's the one before how straight yeah. it is but also how modern because i've seen places in pompeii and and other medieval villages and so on and, so on. and to even today this construction looks so modern it doesn't look ancient it is but it, it's it's using techniques that 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 that, that, that we that have still that have survived, and I think this is the other thing that struck me in in my own research: how many techniques from the Neolithic, particularly in stone building, dry stone walls, um, the techniques of infilling, I read, uh, have actually were, were were actually probably developed during this period. Uh, yeah, you're absolutely right. You know when. When I first saw the archive images, I thought, well, this is really very unusual, very strange. Yeah, yeah. Uh, um, but when we uncovered it again, um, I did have a conversation with a colleague because um, I'm really interested in land art, uh, I have to put, ah, say. And, right. and, and I thought of Richard Long. Um, I don't know if you know yes, him, a, a land yes, artist. Yes. Um, and I had a conversation, a really interesting conversation with a colleague of mine who sort of kind of agreed with me because I thought, well, it's not so much a functional thing, it's more a kind of conceptual thing. That's yes. what I think. Um, yes. And because it's because it doesn't really have any function, you know, it's sort of sort of well, it doesn't have any practical function. And honestly, if you were to walk on the surface, you cut your feet. So 
it's not a pavement it's not the base of a hedge line um we've got no evidence for that whatsoever um, that we do know that there was a a hedge that cut through the central the edge of the central circle um, in the 1870s because it's recorded by a, a surveyor called Charles Diamond in 1870 uh -huh. uh, but we found no traces of that so it's very enigmatic and so I'd like to sort of keep its interpretation fluid and open of course Carolyn will explain Carolyn will probably come up with um, some good ideas next wonderful time. <laughs> I can't, can't wait I don't want to I don't want to preempt them, but um, oh, it, you're right. It, 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 it could be a conceptual um, installation of some sort. So, yes. I mean, I, I kind of think of these monuments as a form of land art because I'm interested in that sort of yeah. thing. So, yeah. You know, it's fascinating that, that, that I'm really surprised that you're saying that. Um, I, I think it's great because I'm, re but you know, from a scientific point of view, it's interesting how your interpretation is more along the lines of cultural. I think it's fantastic because I was looking at in my own work, my own photographic work. I was looking towards the end. I was looking at the work of um, Cornwall, Cornwall-based um, artist. Um, oh, I forget her name now. The name escapes me. Um, she did sculptures of made out of stone, um, lived in St. Ives. What, Hepworth, you mean? Barbara Hepworth, thank you. Her <laughs> stones are very much based along the lines. They're, they're, they're literate. She's literate. Well, I won't say that she's copied, but she certainly has sourced, and she had a very good understanding that was my intuition that told me that she had a very intimate understanding of what these monuments signified how they they standing then and reinterpreted them again and actually going to the point of taking certain elements literally pilfering or inspiring certain elements like the whole yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. Hepworth was really interested. I mean, she lived in, um, she lived very close to Zena. She lived, you, you've got those amazing tours. You've got the amazing hills in, in West Cornwall. And she was inspired. Um, yeah, she was inspired by all those natural sculptural forms that you get at granite landscapes. And so, um, and you're right. Um, and 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 they, they, they look, they can look as modern or they can, they can look as ancient as, as, as you like, really, I suppose. Um, but I, I love Hepworth. I do. I do love Hepworth's work. So, yes, yeah. absolutely. She is fascinating. Yeah. Let's have somebody else. Um, Tim, Tim Hannigan. I wonder if you could say something about the other stone circles on Bodmin Moor and how the hurlers fit into that wider network. Do they all fit a similar pattern? I'll pull it up again. Sorry. Do they all fit a similar pattern? similar age etc okay um well there are as far as i'm aware there are about 16 recorded stone circles on bobman moor and um, most of them are individual circles rather than triple circles so the hurlers is really very unique in the sense that there are three stone circles um relate you know placed in relation to one another as far as I'm aware, there are two double stone circles at Laskernik and King Arthur's Down, um, where you've got two circles uh, forming a monument. And then in West Cornwall, you've got um, Traeger Seal, which traditionally was a double stone circle. And um, I've forgotten the other one, the Merry Maidens. I think there was another stone circle there at the Merry Maidens as well, but that disappeared too. So. So, um, so you've got single step monuments, you've got double monuments, and you've got the unusual triple monuments. And the Hurlers is pretty unique in, in that sense. And with the addition of this stone pavement, which seems to be an integral part of the monument rather than a separate thing, uh, plus the two pipers, plus the other standing stone we found. Um, as I said, you can't really sort of look at the monument, these monuments just as single things within themselves you've got to sort of reach out and look look beyond the edges because these monuments don't really have edges um but we yeah we're assuming that they are of the similar age um oh i just remembered that there was and um, excavations of stone circles are really very rare 
Um, but there was a, the excavation of the Stripple Stones on Bodmin Moor, which is a, also a unique monument because it's a, a circle of stones, a large circle of stones with a recumbent a stone which is lying down in the centre of it, a very large stone. And that sits within what we call a henge monument, which is a, a ditched enclosure where you've got a bank and a ditch, but you've got the, the, the ditch on the inside. And that is a fairly unique monument because that was excavated, um, partly excavated um, around 19, 1908. Um, no finds were found. In fact, I don't think any flints were found at all. So rather, rather sadly, um, we, we can't really say very much about the way it was used, but it's an, a unique monument. So in answer to your question, hopefully, yes, these are broadly, broadly of the same age, but they, they vary. There's varied design. So, um, and some, mod, some stone circles aren't circular. They're more oval than, than circular. So, um, mm -hmm. But so I'm we'll, not an expert on stone circles. <laughs> so <laughs> we're look somebody like John Barnett, who, or my colleague Pete Herring, who are, who are far more expert than I am. <laughs> Excellent. We have another another question from from Tim, and following up from that, the last question, the West Cornwall circles seem generally to be smaller than the Bodmin Moor ones. Do you think that difference suggests distinct hyperlocal cultures? I'm not really quite sure what you mean by that. I mean, local communities, localism. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure that the people of the moor are different from the people of the coast, to, uh, different from the people of the sea, of the, the, the lowlands. So um, I, I don't know the answer to that. I mean, I think you're right. There the were stone circles on the Penwith moors um, because then... They're not all on the moors because the Merry Maidens are on the south part of Penwith, aren't they? And so is Biscow and Oon, um, sitting in historic field systems. Um, I don't, I don't, I, I don't think that. Well, they are, they are local communities' own stone circles. So they, they've, they've got an idea of what they want to do, and that's their manifestation of what of what they've created. Um, I think Carolyn's got some very interesting ideas about some of the West Penwith stone circles. So I think you should ask her. Excellent. If you attend her, attend her talk next week. Well, that's a, that's a great cliffhanger. <laughs> <laughs> Another question that's from John. Question. <laughs> <laughs> Is there any evidence that the people ceased to worship the land in the Iron Age and Roman times? No, no, because um, until Christianity came along, um, most people, most most people in deepest prehistory and even into the Roman period were would would be um, well attuned to their landscapes, worshiping springs, rivers, places. So um, I don't think there's any evidence um, for, of what you're suggesting. Mm -hmm. I think another thing, to, to, two things that also struck me during, during my work, my photographic work. Um, one is the, the deep relationship with, that these communities had with the land. La the land and cultivation of the land meant the difference between life and death, success and failure of that community. And I think they would have been very, very aware of that. Um, there would have been periods of, 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 of hunger, bad crops, and so on and so forth. Um, and, and, and also the, the, the fact of, of leaving our small artifacts, like the, the, the flint artifacts that you, 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 you showed, that they seem to be almost pristine, almost new. Would I be right in saying that? Uh, not worn, in other words. Um, because you, 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 even even in in, in the in, 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 in the in the webcam image that was actually quite not quite fuzzy, I could see a, a serrated edge very clearly actually. Um, so it struck me. But hang on, this is a, a, a new object that is actually left there, and this is a, is this some some sort of symbolic offering? You don't leave some crummy old thing. You leave something that is brand new. Look, this is what I've made as an offering 
here it is. Yeah, 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 yeah you're absolutely right. Um, the flints, uh, which I said, um, the, the large majority, which have never really been examined before until we uh, until we started our recent recent projects. Um, I had uh, one of my colleagues who's a flint specialist look at them, and she said, you know, they're very fresh. She's able to date them by tool um, form. Um, you're right. I think people were leaving things which were functionally um, usable, um, but they were leaving them for other reasons. They were leaving them as votive offerings, perhaps to the land, the ancestors, or maybe just um, a badge or a sign that um, they were there, you know. So um, there is a sort of um, a curation, a deliberate de deposition of objects. Um, obviously, the, the the stone kist at Rillerton Barrow with the skeleton, it was built obviously to house a body, but they left objects with that body, the gold cup being a very unique object. But, um, you know, um, you could quite easily have passed that on to your, your grandchildren or whatever, but they yeah. didn't. They left it with that person so for, yeah. their, for their journey into the afterlife. So, exactly, yeah. exactly. Another last question. Peter. Can you tell us more about the discovery of the extra or missing extra circle discovered by prodding? Okay, um, I didn't really explain it very well, sorry. Um, we investigated that location because um, some years ago um, it was suggested that there was a platform there uh, on which there may well have been a um, an invisible, not an invisible, um, a lost stone circle, and was there was there a fourth circle? So, the, so um, and there were at surface hints of stones buried under the grass, um, and from that a survey map was drawn, and there was a circuit of about twelve stones, uh, forming a, a very small circle about twenty meters in diameter. Um, and a part of that was that large fallen men here that I showed you the photograph of. Um, so, so when we um, did our test pitting in 2016, uh, we um, literally prodded the ground <laughs> with a, um, a ranging pole and uh, just to see whether there was hard rock beneath the grass. I mean, we, we took off probably maybe 20, 30 centimetres of grass and soil to reveal the stones. Um, and in all cases of the 12 different stones we investigated, apart from that one that was lying on the top, um, we found large granite boulders, but they were more stones. They weren't fallen, fallen stones. Um, so, so, and we concluded that actually they were it was it was it was fairly fortuitous there was a platform there um and the and the more stones were probably not part of a made monument Fascinating. Does, that, does that answer your question uh, you, you you can still see anyway you can still see the fallen men here today because it hasn't been re-erected in its socket hole uh perhaps it should be but um that would be something that uh would need agreement with um, the landowners, the duchy and the Bobbymore co commoners, mm -hmm. because it's actually a, a stone which is, um, no, it's, it's, it's part of the landscape today, so yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, so, so I, think, uh, I think it's a good time for a picnic in Bodmin Moor, folks, to <laughs> check out these wonderful well, places well, I, and read well, them in a completely different way after your amazing, most enlightening talk. I heard that some of you who uh, find you know have got easy access to Bob Moor because you live down here might might be in, intrigued enough to go out and have a look at these sites yourself. I mean, one of the beauties of um, the hurlers is that they are a, a very accessible part of Bob Moor. You just can drive to Minions and park at the car park, and then you can go for a walk. And you can go for a walk through to the hurlers, and then you can make your way up onto Stowe's Hill, and if and climb up to the cheese ring and look down and you can see this amazing vistas amazing landscape um so it's um 
it's a really intriguing and, and a very um, accessible part of Bodmin Moor, which um, which is great for all of us who like to go out and about and discover discover new things. Indeed, and uh, and and I think that's a wonderful point in which to 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 to, to draw to a close this this evening's conversation. It's been fascinating. You, you're a wealth of knowledge, Jackie. Thank you so much. You really, um, I, I would be delighted to to invite you again when 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 when, when with more research when, when more research is actually conducted. It will be absolutely brilliant to to actually have a, a continuation of of this. Another comment has has come through. Heidi. This was really interesting. Thank you so much. Making plans to go visit. So yes, the picnic, the Bodmin Moor picnic. I think we've started something here. That's great, Heidi. Thank you so much for that comment. Thank you, Heidi. Thank you, Heidi, for tuning in. <laughs> yeah, I'll take you up there one day if you want. <laughs> Excellent. That's great. So yes, well, thank you so much. And uh, oh, another comment has come through. Thank you, Jackie and Harry. You're very welcome, Richard and, and, and Faye. It's great to great to see you. As a matter of fact, it was Richard who started me, Richard Collington, who actually and Faye, who took me in on a walk in West Penwith um, quite a few years back. And Richard knew quite a bit of the ancient monuments. And it was through him that in a way my interest in ancient monuments in Cornwall started and, and, and what ended up culminated you know, three years later in, 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 in my photographic project. Heidi says that would be amazing. <laughs> I guess it would. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll do it Heidi sometime when you've got a bit of free time, yeah? <laughs> Wonderful. Tim, thank you very much for this fascinating talk. Was up the hurlers a couple of weeks back. Need a return visit now? Yes, absolutely, because now you'll see them in a completely different light. Definitely, this um, this program this is going to be stored in in YouTube, so you'll be able to access it at a later date as well. Um, so even if you wanted to access it on your mobile where you're actually visiting the hurlers themselves, as, as long as you've got a signal, you could access it and actually have a different way of seeing the hurlers with, with Jackie's commentary. Excellent. Jackie, once again, thank you so much. You. I'll say bye-bye. We'll definitely be in touch. And, and, and I'm so, so grateful for this. I'm really, really fantastic, fantastic presentation. Well, thank you, Harry, for the opportunity to to, to, to spread the word. Because one of the one of the key things about the work that we've been doing is to is to really engage people and to sort of promote these special landscapes. And because promoting knowledge about them means that people will value them more, and um, and people will tell other people about them, and um, and get out and about. And it's um, it's good to re it's good to get out into your local onto your local landscape and um, explore a bit so um, absolutely anyway, absolutely well, we, the you my the pleasure we, we must keep in touch definitely okay. bye for now good night bye. Bye. bye okay folks that was absolutely fantastic i hope you really enjoyed that that, that presentation because it was really really an eye-opener um, and definitely this is really a, a, a great point to, to visit these monuments again and see them in a different light because I think we've covered an, a lot of ground today um, that actually is, 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 is interpretative about these um, wonderful objects, wonderful prehistoric architecture. Okay, remember that next week we've got a, a talk by Carolyn Kennett and she is an archaeoastronomer, so she'll be giving yet another twist on this landscape, but actually the, the twist is in relation to celestial bodies, sun, moon, and so on and so forth. So, hope to see you next week. Uh, remember to book your ticket, and yeah, looking forward to see you next week, folks. Bye for now. Thank you.